from New York. I'm an addict named Scott. Scared shit. Woo! Blessed to be here. I'd like to take a moment and, uh, and thank God for bringing us all here. It's just amazing. It's a Saturday night, you know, and we're all in this place. And um, I'm real grateful. Got a lot of gratitude in my heart. I want to thank the uh, Kentuckiana region for inviting me to share my experience, strength, and hope with you. It still blows me away that people like us are invited anywhere. <laughs> Woo. Very, very, very grateful. I... Uh, <coughs> Coming here to uh, to Indiana, I don't even know this Kentucky and Indiana thing. I do a lot of traveling. You know, I travel out of Cincinnati Airport. They tell me it's Kentucky. The Kentuckiana Regional Convention is in Indiana, so I don't even know where I am, but I know I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. do a lot of traveling in my business, and this week since Tuesday, I've been on eight planes and six airports. And, uh, you know, when I was asked to share here this weekend, the first thing that I told Debbie was, I have to ask my wife for permission, because <laughs> I've learned some lessons in here, day at a time. My sponsor told me, sometimes it's easier for you to beg for forgiveness than to ask for permission. So now I ask for permission. And uh, tomorrow we were planning on going to the circus with my two sons. And, um, but I'd let you know that uh, there's no place that I'd rather be than at this convention right here, right now. So a little bit weary off the planes. God, I was on this plane. It was small. It was a small puddle jumper coming out of Cincinnati. And it was rough weather because it was a little, it was raining and all that. And I like roller coasters, but I don't like when planes do that shit. Man, I was like, this ain't no fucking joke. Woo! But when I came here and I put my bag in the room, I was soon to learn that the Kentuckiana region of Narcotics Anonymous loves me. I could feel the love. I'm very, very grateful to be here. It's an honor and a privilege to be asked to share my experience, strength, and hope. And, um, you know, I'm pumped up. I got a lot of love this weekend. Um, I'm definitely plugged in. This light bulb is shining, but the power is coming from another source. Okay? And I know my help has come. I am just a vehicle. That's it. Everybody has a story in Narcotics Anonymous. In placing principles before personalities, it's not who's saying it. It's what's being said. So, um, I'm not going to get into a whole war story. That I'm not going to do. First, I'm going to, I want to just take a moment and, um, and dedicate this message to our predecessors, many who are not here right now in the, in the physical. But, But their spirit marches on. I'd like to dedicate this message to 
single moms in recovery. We love you. We love you. And anybody who's complaining in meetings that the children are too loud, why don't you buy a pack of crayons and a coloring book for $2 and help the mothers out? Because when we love those children, we're carrying the message. And lastly, I want to dedicate this message to the newcomer. With everybody under 90 days clean, please stand up. Welcome. We've been waiting for you. Welcome to Narcotics Anonymous. This is really a beautiful thing. Recovery is not a given. It's an opportunity. And um, if you keep doing what we do a day at a time, Narcotics Anonymous will give you a gift. And that gift is called a choice. And that choice is that just for today... You never have to use again. There's a light at the end of the tunnel, and it's not a train. Okay? That light is recovering addicts. That light is faith is hope in the dark. That's us at the end of the tunnel saying, you do what we do. And you'll be where we're at. Or at least you'll be where you're at clean. You know, Narcotics Anonymous is a simple program. And I'm I'm, I'm not a book thumper, but I bring it, I read it. These books are uh, incredible. One thing that I'm going to share with you out of the chapter, We Do Recover, I think it's one of the most profound single sentences in the book. It says, we do not have to understand this program for it to work. All we have to do is follow direction. And the key to this program is simplicity. You know, um, I am not going to get into a war story. How I got here is not nearly as important as how I've been able to stay here a day at a time. By the grace of God and through the love of the people in Narcotics Anonymous, I've been clean for six days. Five months and 20 years. One day at a time. Sometimes one moment at a time. Sometimes one minute at a time. Sometimes one hour at a time. And... um, If you knew, you just fasten your seatbelt because you're in for the ride of your life. This is a spectacular journey. The journey of a lifetime begins with one day and the first step. And, um, you know, this is a Saturday night. And, um, you know, Saturday nights into Sunday were a horror show for me. It was just, it was the same old, same old, same old, same old. And, uh, you know... Insanity for me was not doing the same things over and over and expecting different results. Insanity for me was doing the same things over and over. I knew what I was getting into and I was willing to pay the price. It had been there, it had been like this for so long. I couldn't claim ignorance. You know, for so long it was like that. You know, for so long it was three and four day runs. For so long, you know, I'd be uh, dressing in Neiman Marcus suits, Giorgio Armani ties, Johnson and Murphy shoes, but the soles on my shoes were so thin if I would have stepped on a piece of bubble gum, I could have told you what flavor it was. <laughs> you know, when I was running hard and fast and long, and, um, you know, I remember, I, rem- I remember to remember where I came from. Um, 
you know, Saturday nights into Sundays. You know, it was just, uh, you know, I, I, it was hope based in desperation. It was a very dark place with not much light at all. You know, it was like hoping that the cop spot would be open on Sunday. Hoping that I didn't get beaten by dummies. You know, hoping that we went back to my place, that you went to the bathroom so I could take some of yours. And hoping that when I went to the bathroom, you didn't take some of mine. You know, it was always and keep going back and forth and back and forth and, you know, like hiding money from myself. Who in this world hides money from themselves? You know what I mean? Just crazy stuff. And, uh, you know, um, I'm blessed today. I'm just blessed that I don't have to live that way anymore. You know, I'm blessed that I'm not like, you know, I, I remember like, you know, going and, and I used to cop in Harlem and um, Washington Heights on St. Nick Wadsworth and Audubon with a Bible in my hand on Sunday morning. So it looked like I fit in with the people that were going to church. But I was so I was so whacked. I was so zooted. I was so paranoid. I thought the people in front of me were following me. I was whacked. You know, it was just always the same old, same old. You know what I mean? I'd be, t- you know, I lived in, in, in Fort Lee, New Jersey, the first stop over the George Washington Bridge that connected Washington, New York to New Jersey. And sometimes when I had the money, I took a bus. You know what I mean? And I'd put like a Walkman on uh, that didn't have batteries because I was shaken. I wanted people to at least think that I was, like, listening to music or something like that, you know? I'd get back to my place, I'd smoke everything up, I'd be like, you know, I'd be like lifting up the hood on the stove and smoking mozzarella cheese at the end of the night, you know? It was crazy. I'd be, like, burning my hair with the stove, I'd have no eyebrows, I'd come out on Monday And my friends would look at me. They'd say, hey, Scott, you look like you got some color this weekend. You go to the beach? I said, no, I never left the damn kitchen. (laughs) It was crazy. Yeah, it's funny today. It wasn't so funny back then. You know what? The last day that I used was like any other day that I used. And uh, and what ended up happening was I wasn't thinking to myself, I wasn't saying, like, I'm going to make a Narcotics Anonymous meeting tomorrow night. Um, that wasn't on the agenda. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had done one of those yets, you're eligible too. And what it was was that I was begging for change. Because, you know, I was, I was on like a three or four day run. And I, I, you know, I had like blisters on the bottom. I was, I was like all tore up. And I didn't think that I could walk back over the GW bridge. So I was trying to grub some money to take a bus back across. And I was begging for change to get back. I never did that. And, um, you know something? The very next day, God gave me change. Because He picked me up, He turned me around, and He placed my feet on solid ground. I ended up in the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous. I didn't go to a detox or a rehab. I'm a byproduct of the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous. I believe in one disease, one program, one sponsor, one home group, one recovery. I am grateful for the unity and the love of this fellowship. My first meeting that I made was, um, was at uh, Yonkers General Hospital. And I uh, was in the cafeteria, and the home group's name was the emergency room. <laughs> yeah, they knew I was coming. By the time I got here, it was an emergency. My ass was on fire. I didn't care who the hell put it out. <laughs> and um, I was the only white guy in the room that night. And I'm just so grateful for my brothers and sisters in the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous. 
that it doesn't matter what or how much you used, who your connections were. It doesn't matter, you know, what your race, creed, religion, lack of religion, sexual identity. None of that stuff matters in here. You know, it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing, the unconditional love that's in the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous. And uh, I don't remember much from the meeting that night. Like I said, I didn't go to a detox, so I was out of my mind at the first meeting. And uh, But I do remember the guy that was sharing, his name was Jerry M. And Jerry hit me in it, he, like a cannonball in the chest. He said, uh, surrender to the high cost of low living. And it was like, it hit me right here. And um, like I said, I don't remember much from the meeting that night. After the meeting... Um, some guys came over to me, and they said, "Scott, you look like you're uh, you look like you're confused, like you don't know what's going on in here." And they were right because the guy that was sharing was also sharing about shooting dope with an eyedropper and a bobo and tying up and squeezing off. And I didn't know any of that, and I was comparing. And the guy came up to me and he said, you know something? It's about identifying and not comparing. Everybody's got different bottoms. Just remember yours. Yours is the only one that counts. And that was important for me because I never used needles. I thought Narcotics Anonymous might have stood for Needles Anonymous. But it doesn't. It doesn't matter what or how much you use in this place. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, you know, it doesn't matter. None of that. You know, we, we, met, we might have come in on different ships, but by the time you come to a place like this, we're all in the same boat. So uh, no matter what you use, welcome. And uh, Rodney M. ended up coming over to me. This guy, Rodney M., may he rest in peace. He came over to me with a meeting list with some phone numbers on it. He asked me for my phone number, too. And he said, why don't you come out with us for a cup of coffee after the meeting? Um, And I said, sure, I was down for a cup of coffee. I didn't want to go home. I had nothing to do. He said, but first there's this business meeting. It'll be quick. Why don't you stay for it? (laughs) Yeah, quick. (laughs) Right? And at that business meeting, he, um, he raised his hand and he said, I nominate Scott to make coffee at this meeting. And underneath, underneath my breath, I said, that motherfucker, he's trying to do me. But I didn't know. I didn't know that he was doing for me that which was done for him. And that's what we do up in this place. And the thing is that after living the way that I was living, okay, I didn't think that I could be responsible to myself. Or I was living in a room with 14 loads of dirty, rancid laundry on the floor. I hadn't opened up my mail in 18 months. I was living my life through my answering machine, screening phone calls. I mean, like, my, my family threw me a birthday party my last year using, and I didn't show up. And my mother was like, Scott, just pick up the phone. We just want to know that you're alive. And I didn't have the courage to pick up the phone. I was sleeping on a bed with no sheets, pissing in Budweiser cans, and this didn't happen in one day. I was living like this for a while, and after, you know, not being responsible to myself, I figured, how could I be responsible to this group and make coffee every Sunday night at 8 o'clock? But in spite of myself, the word yes came out of my mouth, and I made coffee, and I made friends, and I made one bad pot of coffee. And I got to meet everybody in the room. (laughs) That's how it was. Because I got Bustello. I got Bustello at the bodega. In the percolator pot, I forgot to use that thing that holds the coffee. I dumped it in the water. (laughs) The shit was thick and strong. You know, people didn't know if it was a higher powered speaker or a heavenly coffee. They were shaken. But you know something? After the meeting, the people in, the people in, this, in this group came over to me 
And the next week they said, we'll come early. We'll, we'll, we'll show you how to make a good pot of coffee. <laughs> and that's the thing. That's how Narcotics Anonymous works. Nobody ever told me what to do. You people showed me what to do. The example is the most powerful message that we have up in here. You know, there's a saying, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. And if you teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Thank you, Narcotics Anonymous, for loving me. You know, so what ended up happening was, um, you know, I remember uh, uh, I had that coffee commitment. You know, I was making meetings every day. So I would, you know, not just every day. Uh, on Fridays, I'd make... Friday night, 6.30, beginner's meeting, 8 o'clock candlelight. We'd hop into New York City. I'd make a midnight meeting. And then there was a dance club that was close to there. Uh, Saturday, I'd make a noon meeting, a 6 o'clock meeting at night, an 8 o'clock candlelight meeting. I was a meeting-making motherfucker, <laughs> to be honest with you. To be I mean, I'm telling my story. This is just the way it is, and I'm not the spiritual speaker. That's tomorrow on Easter Sunday. This is Saturday night. We're going to party tonight. Woo! So I made meetings. Okay? Everything I needed to stay clean, I heard at my first Narcotics Anonymous meeting. They told me, come early. Stay late. Get involved. Get a coffee commitment. Help with the ashtrays, the brooms, the chairs. When I came in, I'd say, can I read? Can I read? I mean, I was, you know, I, I was gung-ho. They told me to get a sponsor. A sponsor is just another recovering addict who is a year or more clean time and a work knowledge of the 12 steps and 12 traditions. The most important thing about a sponsor is that they can be available to you. Ask that question. Will you sponsor me? Can you be available to me? That's very important. And they're just another recovering addict. Don't put a sponsor any place where they don't belong. They're just another recovering addict. And they're human too. You know, they told me to learn to identify and not compare. You know, they told me that, uh, you know, uh, it's when you identify that you're looking for a way in. And that it's when you're comparing that you're looking for a way out. And this disease speaks to me in my own voice. It's easy for me to find a way out and find the exit from anywhere. That's always an easy thing for me to do. Um, they told me to stay away from people, places, and things. The reason why they told me that is you, you hear things in here. You hear things like... If you hang out in a barber shop long enough, you're going to get a haircut. You know, they told me, you don't go into the lion's den with pork chop underwear and tell the lion to chill out, because he's going to eat up your ass real quick. You know? You don't go into a whorehouse to hear the piano player. It's simple. It's simple stuff. Making meetings was very, very important. Meeting makers make it. In the readings, it says those who make meetings regularly stay clean. Many meetings, many chances. Few meetings, few chances. No meetings, no chances. So, like, suggestions are very, very important. We don't have to understand this program for it to work for us. All we have to do is follow direction and be loved. Let us love you until you can learn to love yourself. Because a love, this disease has met its master. Love turns dead ends into endless highways. The possibilities are so far beyond my comprehension. If I would have told you what I expected to get out of recovery in my first 90 days, I would have sold myself short like I did my whole damn life. 
I believed I was a C or a D. I believed I was the grades I got on my report card. And I am not the grades I got on my report card. I have been loved by you. You people believed in me and wanted to help me in my recovery. That's why I'm here. Because you people loved me. You took a stand for me. You accepted me. You believed in me. Sometimes you even tolerated me. Because I've done some crazy shit in here. So I'm grateful for your love. Service is a very, very important thing. And I have had a commitment in this fellowship, Narcotics Anonymous, since my first day clean. I've had a commitment for over 20 years. I have, when, my, when I got into recovery, my sponsor mandated me to be in the middle of this program. And just, just for you people that, that can't hear, I do some sign language in here. You know, mandated to be in the middle. It was not negotiable. If I was not making meetings, calling my sponsor, involved in service and working steps, he told me, then you can find a new sponsor. You know, um, I mean, it's important. There's no sugarcoating this stuff. When they told me when I came in here, they said, change or die, motherfucker. That's what they told me. When I came into meetings in the beginning, they told me, listen, you, sh you sit down and you listen. He said, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. To do twice as much listening and half as much talking. They said, you learn to listen, you listen to learn. You don't know shit about recovery. When we want to know where the cop, we'll ask you. <laughs> Become a student. Today, I know that I don't know. I know that I'm teachable. Every day I learn. I learn from you people. You people are my hope. Hope stands for hearing other people's experience. I get my hope from you. I was listening to last night's speaker, Rob. I was listening to today I was at Parenting and Recovery and Spiritual Principles. I got what I need. I was crying. And I ain't soft. But I was crying, and I wasn't crying for the speaker. When I cry today, I cry for me. I am blessed. I heard what I needed to hear. I'm fragile, I'm frail, and I'm weak. I'm not a finished product. God is not through with me yet. But the healing has begun. The lie is dead. We don't die. Today we multiply. We do recover. This is a beautiful thing, Narcotics Anonymous. And the way that recovery is possible is through the steps. And I got a sponsor, and my sponsor guided me through the steps. And uh, I was guided through the 12 steps and 12 traditions of this program within my first year of recovery. And there were some people that were saying, oh, Scott's in the step of the month club, or Scott's a stepologist. And like, you know, listen, whatever. You know, that's just the way it is in here. In the readings, it says the sooner we face our problems within our society, just that much faster do we become acceptable, responsible, and productive members of that society. The sooner. You know, the thing is, don't give people misinformation in this place. You know, Narcotics is Anonymous is a beautiful place. But it says in our readings, we... we uh, uh, something about after, after we came to N.A., we realized we were sick people? After. I mean, there are some people in here that will piss on your head and tell you it's raining. You can't believe everything that you hear. If you believe everything that you hear, when you get into a meeting, you'll walk out more fucked up than when you walked in. <laughs> Keep what you need and leave the rest. And take something out with you. You know, it's important to take something out with you. You know, like I remember, um, I heard this story. First of all, you hear different things. And I heard people say, oh, 
They told me to dump. They told me to dump. And our primary purpose is not to dump. Our primary purpose is to carry the message to the addict who still suffers. You see, the thing is, what happens in here is you're only here for an hour, an hour and a half a day, and then there's 22 and a half or 23 hours out there. And if you come in and you dump the dirty water, and then you go back out for 22 and a half hours, this glass is going to fill up with dirty water. But if you're guided through the 12 steps, 12 traditions, and the principles of this program, it's like filling this glass up with solid rocks. And if you put a rock of acceptance and hope and faith and willingness and courage and trust and humility and, 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 and forgiveness and perseverance and spirituality and service and understanding and compassion and empathy and unconditional love, and forgiveness, and abundance. And there is an abundance of spiritual principles, mind you. There are not just 24 spiritual principles. If you, the, more, the more rocks that you have in the glass, the less room there is for dirty water. You know, and that's how we get through what we need to go through a day at a time in here. You know, because we go through some stuff. You know, life on life's terms, listen, I'm not here to paint a pretty picture and, and put whipped cream and cherries on stuff. This is perhaps the most difficult thing that I've ever done in my life is staying clean. But the reality is, it's beyond my wildest dreams and it's been worth it. You know, by, by learning through being loved by another person and learning to stay away from the first one. It's that first one that always got me. That first one, I never knew. I never knew one was too many when, and a thousand was never enough. I never, they told me, you know, you think that, you, they said, if you stay away from the first one, you don't have to worry about all the rest. If you think staying away from the first one is tough, try staying away from the second one. That's even more difficult. And that's what it's about. And that, you know, that I learned through the first step. You know, I have a... My, my best friend, Mark Kay, and Mark Kay shared at this convention years back, um, may he rest in peace, a foot soldier and my hero. Mark Kay always used to say that the 12 steps and the 12 traditions were like 24 wrenches that'll fit any size nut that walks in the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous. <laughs> Listen, anything that's coming out of my mouth, I didn't come up with one original thought, idea, or profound saying. But I learned to listen, and I listened to learn. I become a student. I needed to learn. I needed to, I needed to, to, to keep something and hold on to it in that hour and a half that would keep me clean for the next 22 and a half hours. You know, and I heard things about the 12 steps, that the 12 steps were about clean it up, keep it up, uh, clean it up. Clean it up, uh, give it up, make it up, and keep it up. And that it was about trust God, clean house, and help others. And that it was about trace it, face it, replace it, and erase it. You know, and those things I kept close to my heart. I needed stuff like that. You know, when my sponsor guided me through the principles of this program, and... Um, as a result of that, I'm here today. And um, Narcotics Anonymous has given me many, 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 many blessings and gifts and choices and opportunities. Uh, but it's only as a result of working the steps of this program. You know, if you're clean, okay, work the steps with the guidance of a sponsor. Because if you're not working the steps, it's like winning the lottery and you're not cashing in your ticket. You get it? You gotta dig it to dig it. This is some cool stuff in here. We're miracles. This is a, this is miraculous that we have a gathering like this. In my first step, it says that we're powerless over our, we, we admitted that we were powerless over our addiction and our lives have become unmanageable. And my sponsor told me, he said, do you know the difference between admitting and accepting? And I said, no. He said, you admit I admit to you 
and I accept for me. Okay? So when I did my first step, I, had, I, I became honest with myself. I needed, to learn, I needed to tell myself the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I cannot use safely or successfully without the whole package deal and paying severe consequences for my actions. All right? My second step says that we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could, could restore us to sanity. And, and, and my second step, thank God the second step came before the third step. You know what I mean? Because a power greater than myself was like, there were many, many, many power greater than myself. You know, when, when, I, when I was out of my mind and I felt like using you know, I remember I had, I had a little under 90 days clean, and, and I called up my sponsor, and I, my sponsor's name was Papa Smurf, because he looked like Papa Smurf. And I said, Pops, I'm not going to the meeting tonight. I'm not making coffee. I'm going to use. My sponsor said, you just hold on, because I'm coming to pick you up in five minutes, and he picked me up. And they say, yeah, you can carry the message, you can't carry the addict. There are times in my recovery where you people carried me. All right? Papa Smurf brought me to the meeting that night. Okay? And I shared. Man, I shared veins coming out of places I didn't even know I had. I I don't want to be with you. I wouldn't use with you people when when you were using. I don't believe you're clean. I don't want this. You know, I want to use. And you know something? By the end of the meeting, I felt a little bit better. I heard someone say one time that meetings are like orgies. You come out feeling so good and you don't know who did it to you. And you know what? That night, that night I don't know who did it to me. But I didn't leave, I didn't leave before the miracle happened. You know, something magical happens around the tables in the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous. You know, so coming to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. I remember being out of my mind in my apartment. I'd call my sponsor. I'd feel better. That was a power greater than myself. When I didn't want to go to a meeting, but I had a commitment and I made the meeting and I felt better, that was a power greater than myself. You know, there are times that I... I remember there were times I had two cats when I first got clean, freedom and faith. Look, there are times that they kept me clean. Maybe it's because I didn't want to smoke cat litter at the end of the night. <laughs> but whatever it was, it was a power greater than myself. I remember being dressed up in a suit in New York City, all dressed up, going to work. And I'd, I'd be fucked up. You know, I'd be at, you know, they say a monkey in a suit is still a monkey. You know, I didn't feel right. Because it doesn't matter how you dress up the outside. Recovery is an inside job. So I was going through some feelings. But I'd see someone walking by with keychains swinging. That was a power greater than myself. There were many, many, many power greater than myself that could restore me to sanity. The ultimate form of insanity is for me to use again. Okay, that's it in a nutshell. In the third step, it says we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. And listen, when I was on this step, it was not about God. It wasn't really a God thing. You know, this whole coming to believe is a process, not an event. And um, I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the good, orderly direction that this program had to offer. I made a decision to continue not using no matter what. I made a decision to continue making meetings, to continue calling my sponsor, to continue being involved in service, and to continue working steps. And with that, I wrote the fourth step. You know, I, 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 I wrote my fourth step. It didn't, you know, the thing about the fourth step, it doesn't, you know, I've been on my fourth step for two years can't be on your fourth step. You ain't doing the fourth step if you're on it for two years. You know, it's my understanding you're doing your work in your fourth step when you have a pen in your hand and a piece of paper. It doesn't take that long to write. You know, you just do it. You do it. You sit down. You say a prayer. Dear God, help me to be as honest and thorough as I can be. Thank you. Amen.
Get busy. You know? After I wrote my fourth step, and that was the first thing in my whole life that I completed without cheating. Because I cheated my whole life. I got kicked out of Boston University in 1979 for cheating. You know? Um, I, 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 I shared the fifth step with my sponsor. And we said a prayer, and we invited God in. And um, when I shared with him, he was identifying. He was writing some stuff down. He shared some stuff with me. I felt like I wasn't alone. He was identifying. I felt the love. I felt the compassion. I felt the, under, the underlying stream that runs between you and me. I felt the love. And uh, what ended up happening was like my sponsor at the end, he gave me a hug and a kiss and he told me that he loved me. And I always thought that if you knew who I really was, that you'd leave and that you wouldn't be there for me. And uh, this was the only time in my life that one person knew everything about me. Because different people in my family knew this, my using people knew that, my girlfriend knew this. You know, uh, you know, by the time my life became so unmanageable, everyone knew pretty much that I was using and it collided. But I'm grateful for the love that my sponsor showed me. And it was like I emerged from isolation. I was like a cocoon turning into a butterfly. And uh, it was, you know, it was spectacular. And I've done, you know, several fourth and fifth steps in recovery. And the sixth step says that we were entirely ready for God to remove... <clears throat> all these defects of character. And, um, you know, it's about willingness. It's about awareness. It's about open-mindedness. It's about humility. You know, um, you, you, you know, the thing is that these, these, are, these are steps, you know, these are difficult steps. This is work. This takes work. But there comes a point in time where we can't rationalize and justify our insane behavior and say, well, I'm not on that step or I'll shelf that for later or that's an old behavior. Listen, if you're doing it, it ain't no old behavior. You know what I mean? And um, this disease can be arrested at some point. And it's through working these steps. And, you know, when my sponsor was writing my fifth step, I said, like, what were you writing? And he said, oh, I was writing down your defects of character. I said, well, what were they? He said, well, you got them all. So, you know, that was the, you know, and I really believe that defects of character, you know, the real deal for me is that there's only one and it's fear. You know what I mean? And it's about, you know, if there, you hear different things in here. Defects of characters, the things that I do that I shouldn't do and shortcomings, the things that I don't do that I should do. And, you know. Yeah, I heard someone say a defect of character is like knowing that you have a flat tire and a shortcoming is saying, fuck it, I'm driving on it anyway. <laughs> I believe that the sixth step is about the thought. The seventh step is about the action. You know, and for the, that, the defects of character, if it's the anger, the fear, the lust, and that was a, almost killed me, lust in recovery. You know, like, shh, that's a whole nother meeting. <laughs> you know, it didn't matter if it was free or I was paying for it. I was paying for it. I was in so much pain. I mean, the way to build character in that seventh step is just by doing the opposite. You know, if I'm self-centered and selfish, then it's about being selfless and be learning to be there for the next guy. A lot of those spiritual principles I learned as a result of being involved in service, you know, about being there for somebody else and not expecting anything in return. These were lessons that I didn't even know that I was learning until after I was in the middle of it. And I'm grateful for that. My eighth step, you know, um, and I don't mean to gloss over seven and eight because those are ongoing, man. You know, once you think you got it in here, you're going to get it. You know, I have not arrived. That ain't happening. I'm a work in progress. And uh, in my eighth step, I, 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 made, I made a list of all persons that I had harmed, and I became willing to make amends to them all. 
They were people that came from my fourth step and all the people that I heard in recovery too. Because I came in here tearing shit up. I left bruises behind. And um, I made the list and I became willing. And then I went over the list with my sponsor and he crossed a whole bunch of people off the list. You know, said, you know, you don't. You don't make amends to certain people. You might just end up in jail or killed. He said, there's a big difference between telling a lie and being a damn fool. You know, and, you know, even before this making amends thing, I remember when I came into the rooms. Also, I was in debt. Forty eight thousand dollars. I owed IRS. Eighteen thousand dollars. And when I had 90 days clean, they found me. And they didn't want to hear, I was, you know, not going to tell them, well, listen, I'm on my slogans. Easy does it. Wait until I get on my ninth step. You know, I needed to learn to be responsible early on in recovery. You see, freedom is not free. With freedom comes responsibility. And, um, you know, so I made amends and a lot of them to the people that were close to me. Um, the family and got to make amends to uh, my mother and my father, uh, my all of my family, all the people, the customers. I mean, I just, I was, I was, uh, I'm blessed that I got to make amends to my dad while he was alive. Um, I had seven good years clean with my dad, where my actions spoke louder than my words. I got to do things for my father that he never did for me. I don't blame my father. I know my father only knew the love that was given to him. Listen, you can't give away what you don't have. He just didn't have it. But I remember when he was dying in the hospital and changing his diapers and feeding him like peaches when he was incoherent on morphine. May he rest in peace. I'm blessed with this program, man. This is just a a spectacular thing. In my 10th step, it says that we continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. And that's just about slowing things down, taking a break, you know, taking a look at what you can't claim ignorance to what your behavior is today. You know what I mean? There's no right way to do the wrong thing. You know, there isn't. There's no right way to do the wrong thing. And today it's about avoiding pain and maintaining happiness. And, um, you know, it's about cleaning up my side of the street. It's And thoroughly. I hate people that make amends and they're like, I am really sorry that I did that, but this is why I did it. Like, what? In my 11th step, it says that we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. And... Um, You know, an important word in that step is improve. Because I came in here only knowing foxhole prayers. And then I learned to say the serenity prayer. And then I've learned some other prayers. The most powerful prayer for me is help, dear God. Help me. Just one word, help. And um, there are many different ways that I pray. I pray in silence. I pray with words. I could pray with music. I could pray alone. I could pray with you. You know, and the same is true for meditation. You know, the most important thing is that you find something that that's comfortable, that works for you. Try different things. You know, the most important thing for me is praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Sometimes I like to tell God what to do and when to do it, you know, but uh, God's will is always done. And, um, you know, in the 12th step, it says that having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to addicts and to practice these principles in all our affairs. And there are many spiritual awakenings that happened along the way. You know, I remember the first day that I didn't feel like using. That was a spiritual awakening when the obsession and the compulsion to use was lifted. You know, when I was able to walk around with five or ten dollars in my pocket because five was one and ten was three. You know, um, 
I, 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 many, many spiritual awakenings along the way. But as a result of these steps, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, for me, was that this program worked for me. And when I came in, I believed that it would work for you. But I felt so shitty about myself, I didn't think it would work for me. And, um, you know, the easy part of the step is, is, is trying to carry this message to addicts and the service that we do. You know, man, you could, you could teach a parrot how to carry a message of recovery, but the message is meaningless unless we live it. You know, um, there are many different ways to carry the message. Many, many ways. We can do it through group service. We could do it through different uh, hospitals and institutions. I'm an H&I kind of guy. That was my thing. There's public information. There's events and activities. There are GSR commitments. There are area service commitments. The most important thing is that you, you find an area service that you're comfortable with. And if you're able to take service outside of the group, then you're joining the real foot soldiers in Narcotics Anonymous. You want to strengthen your recovery? Take a commitment outside of your group. This is not uh, how it happens. This is how it works. You know, service is a spectacular thing. I'm grateful for the people who did service, man. I remember coming into recovery. I didn't know how to learn and live and enjoy my life without the use of drugs. I remember going to dances when I was, you know, just getting clean. You know, I remember some people saying like, oh, I don't want to go to that, you know, that dance over there. They're playing that sort of music. Or I don't want to go to that picnic on that side of town because they're doing that. And then, man, listen, I went to every dance, every picnic, every everything. You know, I went to picnics. That's where I learned how to, you know, eat rice and beans and collard greens. You know, I'm a, I'm a man of color today. Because of the love that this fellowship has given me. you got to try different things and be open-minded to different things and practice. You know, we increase our unity when we participate in each other's recovery. It's not about being black or white. It's about everybody being all right. You know? Love has no color, and this disease has no prejudices. So why should I become prejudiced when I come in here? Man, it didn't me that matter who I was copping from when I was using. All of a sudden, I come in here, and I'm becoming particular who I can love and who can I allow to love me. Ain't that something else? I'm grateful for the service in Narcotics Anonymous. And you know, the most difficult part of the 12th step is trying to practice these principles in all our affairs. But if you ain't practicing them in all your affairs, then you have too many damn affairs. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not saying I'm golden, I'm Teflon. I come up short. Just ask my fucking wife. <laughs> she points it out all the time. I come up short. But I'm grateful that I have steps that I could rectify that. You know, there are so many blessings, gifts, and miracles. Man, when I was using, I never got off the corner. There were no holidays, no vacations, no sick days. I lived to use and I used to live. And as a result of having some choices, man, I've been some places here. Man, I've been to, uh, I've been to uh, Wyoming and Grand Teton National Park. I've been horseback riding in the Grand Tetons. Whitewater rafting down the Snake River. I've seen bald eagles flying majestically through the sky. I've seen deer and antelope and, and mooses and stuff like that. I went up in a hot air balloon 10,000 feet up in the air where God seemed so big and I seemed so small. I remember my honeymoon. We went to my wife and my, I got married in recovery, you know, blessing, gift to an earthling, a normie. Thank God. Been in some sick ones in here, although they can work in here, not me, because I was sick. Okay, I attract what I am. It's all a mirror in here. This book might as well be a mirror. Let me tell you, I went to Hawaii. I, I was 
I was scuba diving with, with dolphins and turtles under the water. I mean, it was like I was underwater like 50, 75 feet swimming, saying, don't you know I'm a crackhead? <laughs> Just incredible. Um, I got married in recovery. That's a blessing and a gift. My wife and myself tried to have children um, for our first, like, three, four years in recovery. And we went through outside help and fertilizations and interuterine inseminations. I think we must have had ten of them. And then we tried in vitro fertilization. And um, the first one didn't take. And on the second one, she got pregnant. And um, and people were like, you know, hearing me share in meetings and they were they were like, man, you're going to make a great dad. We're so happy for you. You know, this is just a blessing. And then later on into the pregnancy, my wife miscarried. And it was just devastating, man. It was really like my whole world, everything that I long for, everything that I that I know that I'm worthy of and deserving of. It was shattered. And um what ended up happening, and then time release, people that I saw at meetings, it could have been six months later, were like, how how you doing, Dad? And it would be like, oh, I'd have to go through this thing time released. And what ended up happening was my wife and myself took some time off from the process because it was like, it was really tough. It was like, you know, I'm ovulating, let's do it. <laughs> you know, if my next door neighbor said that to me, I'd be down, you know what I mean? But it wasn't, you know, it was just, it was tough. It was, I felt a lot of pressure, you know. And she did too. It was tough on her. She was, she was going through her own stuff. So we took a year off. And then we started again. We embarked upon it. And I remember when we were going to see the sonogram the first time to see if there was a heartbeat. I was scared. I said, called up my sponsor. I said, I feel like this is the day of judgment. And he said, it's not. You know, the failure or success of this event is not if there's a heartbeat. He said, the success is that you and your wife found the love and the courage within each other to try again. And uh, by, by the grace of God and through the love of the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous, my son Andrew was born on July 8th, uh, 2004. And then what happened was a couple of years later, I was, I do a lot of traveling and I was telling my wife my calendar and I'm busy and I'm busy and I was traveling from September through November right after Thanksgiving. My, my workload was going to break and we were going to embark upon in vitro fertilization again January 1st. And, um, what ended up happening was by the grace of God, my wife became pregnant naturally. With the God, you know, <clears throat> The thing is, what the doctors said was impossible, God makes possible. You know, so here's a picture. And you want to know something? It's an honor and a privilege to be a parent in recovery. It's, it's, it's a commitment. It's an obligation. It's a responsibility to be Mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, nourishing, nurturing, and supportive. And I'm just blessed for the love that I've shown, that I was shown when I got here. Because you can't give away what you don't have. And uh, I've learned a different way today. And um, I have a beautiful wife. She's my best friend in the whole world. Um, I, I, I can honestly say, like, listen... I'm a great father, but I'm only a good husband. I heard what I needed to hear at the meetings today, and I got some work to do in my relationship with my wife when I get back home. Because I could be so accepting and so unconditional and so loving and so patient and so tolerant with all of my sponsees, but I ain't giving it to my best friend in the whole world, my wife. You know, and... Um, I got some work to do, and that's only because God speaks through you. I hear him loud and clear. Um, the blessings and the gifts have been plentiful. 
Uh, God is the giver of every gift in my, in my life today. Sometimes thanking him isn't good enough. Sometimes I have to praise his name because he continues to do for me that which I could never do for myself. I am so grateful that when I was running the streets, that whenever I forgot about him, that he never forgot about me. It was then that he carried me. You know, I want to thank once again the Kentuckiana region for asking me to share. This is a beautiful weekend, a lot of love, a lot, a lot of hugs, a lot of great recovery here. This is really about living and enjoying our life without the use of drugs. And um, I'm going to close with the story that my best friend Mark K. used to share. Mark, may he rest in peace, my hero. And he shared about this guy that was looking for his spirituality. And he was looking for his spirituality, and he went into the rooms, went into a meeting, and he said, how do I become more spiritual? How do I become more spiritual? And, you know, you, you ask some advice in the rooms in Narcotics Anonymous, if there are 12 people, you hear 14 answers in here. So fortunately, the last person said, you know, if you want to become more spiritual, why don't you ask your sponsor? If you want what he has, then you're going to become willing to do what he did. And he went up to his sponsor and he said, hey, sponsor, I want to become more spiritual. I want to find my spirituality. He said, what do I do? He said, listen, I want you to go into the woods and I want you to go grizzly bear hunting. And he looked at him like. Grizzly bear? What does that have to do with spirituality? But he wanted what his sponsor had, and he went into the woods with a rifle, and he went grizzly bear hunting. And he was in the woods, and it was cold, and it was dark, and there were no grizzly bears around. And then it was colder, and the temperature dropped, and it began to drizzle and get wet, and he was freezing. And he was like, you know, he was losing it a little bit. You know, losing the, the commitment, and the focus, and the primary purpose and he was saying, man, I'm getting hungry. I'm cold. I need warmth. I need to dry up. I need some food. He said, fuck this. I'm out of here. And he got up off the rock that he was sitting on. And he started to walk out of the woods. And what happened was this great, great big old grizzly bear came up and started to run after him. And he saw the grizzly bear and he threw the rifle and he ran like hell. And the grizzly bear ran after him and he hit him right upside the head. And the guy fell down on the floor and the guy said, dear God, I hope this is a spiritual grizzly bear. <laughs> and the grizzly bear looked up and said, dear Lord, please bless this meal that I'm about to receive. <laughs> and what's the moral of the story? If you're looking for something, you're going to find it. You know, if you're doing meth or you're smoking crack and you want to learn how to shoot dope, you can find it in the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous. And if you want some love and you want some recovery, you can find that in Narcotics Anonymous. And if you want some hostage, a hostage in some pain, then you can go to the dance and you can find it there. And then there's a marathon meeting after where you could share the pain. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of great things in here. You know, there's the disease, which is fear, and there's love. And um, in parting, I'll say, you know, don't let anybody tell you not somebody. Because first things first, you're a child of God, and God doesn't make any junk. And if nobody told you they love you today, I do, and God loves you more. But check out who you're hanging out with. Thank you.